Well, good Sunday morning, beloved ones, and thank you for tuning in today. I appreciate it. So over in Psalm 33, we read this. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart rejoices in Him because we trust in His holy name. Notice the connection there between trust and rejoice, right? Our hearts rejoice in Him. Why? Because we trust in Him. Joy, rejoicing flows out of trusting in Him. Our heart rejoices in Him because we trust in His holy name. Let your loving kindness, O Lord, be upon us according as we have hoped in you. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray today that you would enable us, you would help us to trust in you. You are our hope, our help, our shield, our refuge. And Father, out of that trusting in you, I pray that you would bring a rejoicing, a rejoicing in you. Father, I pray that you would meet and minister to the various needs represented as folks have tuned in today. And I pray especially as we sit before your word, that your word would be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path even this very day. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Majesty Thank you, Christina. And we turn back one more time over to 2 Peter, and in particular, 2 Peter chapter 3, as we bring this chapter and we bring this study to a close. And I do hope and pray that this time in 2 Peter has been a blessing and an encouragement to you, and it has been to me. But you might remember last week, we left off right in the middle of this closing section. So let's go back and read it, and let's see what God has for us today in His Word. I'm going to start back up in verse 13. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth 
in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. And regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort as they do the rest of scriptures to their own destruction. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard, so that you're not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. And then a related passage in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul writes there, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. And I wanted to include in that Corinthians passage here, just as a helpful reminder to us, that even as we are commanded to grow, as we are here in 2 Peter, grow is the command, in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we have to recognize and we have to understand and emphasize that it is God who causes the growth. It's God who enables and produces the growth. Now, this doesn't negate our responsibility to be obedient to God's command and to God's word, but it does help us to move obedience out of the worldly realm of self-reliance and self-achievement, and self-congratulation, and into the biblical realm of a spirit-yielded, Christ-focused, God-glorifying obedience to the Word. Now, to the text itself here in 2 Peter. A quick review will be helpful, I think. So you'll remember we said last week, Peter closes with a series of four commands. I put them like this, strive and know, guard and grow. Strive and know, guard and grow. And you'll remember, we looked at the first two commands last week. You'll remember those two commands were set up against uh, the backdrop of awaiting, eagerly awaiting the fulfillment of God's redemptive plan. The new heavens and new earth where righteousness dwells. Since you look for these things, strive to be found by him, living in peace and purity. And no, that was the second command. Regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. The Lord's merciful patience with us and with the sin sickness and rebellion of this world against Him. He's patient as He is bringing all who are His unto salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we don't have to walk around like we said last week, always saying, how long, O Lord? No, we can sing forth how long suffering you are. How patient you are, O Lord, as you are bringing all who are yours unto Christ, and not one will be lost. All praise to him. Now, the last two commands we're going to look at today, guard and grow, they're set up against the backdrop of this awareness that there are false teachers out there who are distorting God's revealed word. And you'll remember, There in verse 15 and through verse 16, Peter says, in essence, he says to his audience, look, these same things that I'm telling you, Paul wrote to you in his letters, these same things. In other words, there's a consistent apostolic witness and teaching here. And you would do well to pay attention to it as a light shining in the dark place. That's the end of chapter 1. But Peter notes here that some of the things in Paul's letters are hard to understand. Yes, they are. But Peter's point here is that there are untaught and unstable folks, those who are not grounded in the Word and firmly rooted upon the Lord Jesus Christ, who will come along and take these more difficult teachings of Paul and distort them, just as they do the rest of Scripture, Peter says. This is their strategy. This is their modus operandi. They're going to take the word and twist it and distort it to make it say what they want to say in order to fulfill their own sinful lusts and desires. 
and their aim is to lead others astray with them. And Peter says it will be to their own destruction. And so Peter says, now this is getting into our new material here for today, verse 17. I'll put this under proactive preparation. He says, knowing this beforehand. In other words, since you know this ahead of time, that these folks are going to come along twisting the word of God and trying to lead you down sinful paths and destructive paths, since you know this ahead of time, you can be ready. Knowing this beforehand. Paul wants these believers, uh, Peter wants these believers and us to be proactive. You don't have to wait for these folks to show up in the church, or you don't have to wait for these folks to show up on your doorstep to start getting ready. Proactive preparation here. If you remember a few weeks ago, we had that winter storm. And for a week ahead of time, the weather forecasters were telling us what was coming, right? Dangerously cold temperatures, snow moving in, high winds for a couple of days. And so what did you do? You made preparations, most likely. You went out to the store and you got the things that you needed. Uh, I went uh, that Wednesday before to Meyer, and, it, and you would have thought the world was coming to an end. Uh, but you, you prepared ahead of time. You got kerosene for your heater or wood for your wood stove. You made arrangements to stay with somebody else. You got your bread and your milk. (laughs) Although I've never been snowed in and thought I'd love a nice cold glass of milk. But you went out and bought that stuff anyway. You prepared. And that's the picture here. Peter says, since you know these folks are coming along, be ready. In particular, be on your guard and grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So let's take these two commands. As as proactive preparation, let's look at these two commands. Verse 17, first of all, be on your guard. Uh, This is a general call to alertness. Be ready. Keep watch. Now, that doesn't mean we live in fear. Uh, That doesn't mean we have to go on a heretic hunt every time we step out the front door. But we don't want to live, beloved ones, in a kind of naivete where whenever somebody comes along and says to us, well, this is what God's Word says, and so you need to live like this, you need to do this, you need to take this action. Well, wait a minute. Let's go to the Word of God and find out for ourselves. And by the way, a great way to be on guard is simply be in the Word so you can recognize distortion and error when it comes along. But the general call to alertness here, be on your guard, be watchful, so that, right, staying right there in verse 17, so that you are not carried away. You are not led astray by the error of unprincipled men. Now notice the descriptions we've had so far. Peter has called these folks, and I think they're still the false teachers from, from chapter 2, but Peter calls these folks untaught, unstable. Now he calls them unprincipled, meaning what? Well, this idea of unprincipled is the idea of casting off, throwing off all restraints, and in particular, to gratify the desires of the sinful flesh. And so God, in his word, has provided for us instruction, and part of that instruction is restraint. It's it's boundaries for us. And God has given them for us for our good. He's given these boundaries and restraints to us because He loves us, because He's concerned about our joy in Him and giving glory to Him, which is where we're most satisfied, by the way. You do the same thing with your kids, right? You give boundaries and restraints uh, because you love them. You care for them. You care for their well-being. And God does the same thing in His Word. But these folks are coming along and casting off those restraints, distorting and twisting God's Word. It is a lawlessness for the purpose of sinfulness. That's the idea of unprincipled here. And the error of unprincipled men, let's be clear about the error here. It's not that they've misunderstood a passage of the Bible. I mean, that happens to all of us. It's that they are distorting the word to make it say what they want to say so they can do what they want to do. And at the root of it 
is pridefulness, right? I'm my own authority. The Word doesn't have authority over me. I have authority over the Word. And I'll twist it and deny it and distort it so I can go do what I want to do. It's the height of arrogance and pridefulness. So the error here is not simply doctrinal. It's part of it. But it's also moral and at the root a prideful arrogance. So, and and Peter says, you know, these folks want to take you with them. Be on your guard. Be alert. So you're not carried away down that sinful and prideful path. And as a result, fall from your own steadfastness. Well, there's the danger Peter's concerned with here, that a believer would fall from his or her own steadfastness. Now, what does that mean, to fall from your own steadfastness? That does not mean lose your salvation, just in case somebody would read it that way. But think about this. When you are led down this pathway of twisted and distorted truth, and especially for the purpose of fulfilling uh, your own sinful desires, when you're led down this path of twisted truth, It really is like trying to navigate your way through one of those funhouse hall of mirrors, only it's not a funhouse. I mean, you get in the middle of that twisted truth and distorted path, and you don't know which way's up. You you get to the place where you can't discern biblical truth from Satan's lies. Everything around you looks distorted. You look in the mirror, and it looks distorted. And instead of having a steadfastness, a strong grasp on the truth of God's Word, and standing firm upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Next thing you know, you're out on the shifting sands with the unstable folks. So fall from your own steadfastness. It's not losing your salvation, but you can lose your steadfast assurance of your salvation as you lose your grip and grasp on the truth of God's Word. And by the way, Assurance is on Peter's mind here. We know that from chapter 1 where he says, make your calling and election sure. It's a miserable condition for the believer to live in, to lose a sense of his or her joyful assurance of their salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as part of pastoral counseling, I talk to folks on a regular basis who are are walking in this miserable condition. They, this, the believer has lost a sense of his or her assurance of their salvation. And in my pastoral experience, it usually comes down to one of three reasons. Sometimes a combination of the three, but usually one of three reasons. First, either the person has never been rightly taught about the sovereignty of God in their salvation. Well, a good Bible study will help that. And we try to emphasize that all the time around here. Or sometimes a person is walking through a season of intense persecution and they think God has abandoned them in some way and they start to wonder, well, was I ever really his? Did I belong to him to begin with? Well, again, a good Bible study on the promises of God will help us. But sometimes this lack of assurance is because just what what Peter's concerned with here. A person is bought into some deception, some twisted truth. They're headed down some sinful path. They've been going down it for a while. They're in this hall of mirrors. They don't know which way's up. And they've lost their grip on the truth. And now they look at themselves in in this distorted mirror and they think, well, is this what a child of God looks like? Maybe I'm not a child of God. Maybe I never was. And the doubt begins to set in. Beloved ones, when you move away from the truth of God's Word, over time it erodes away at your steadfastness, at your assurance of salvation. And so this is vitally important. Be on your guard that you're not carried away by the error of the wicked and fall from your confident assurance. So there's this general call to alertness. And then the second command... Grow. Grow. This is a great defense system against being led astray and falling from your own steadfastness. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of your Lord and Savior, 
Jesus Christ. By the way, just to point out to you here, it's an active command. It's an active command, which is to say it is ongoing. In other words, this isn't a one-week thing. Or, you know, I'm going to go to a weekend seminar about growing in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And, okay, I've got that figured out. I'm done with that one. Let's move on to the next thing. No. This is the pilgrim's journey. This is until he calls me home or he returns. Grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's ongoing. It's part of the Christian's journey, and it is a necessary safeguard. Grow. So let's think, first of all, here about growing in grace. Grow in grace. Let's give some definition to grace. That'll be helpful. We could simply define grace as God's unmerited favor toward us. But let's put some, let's put some flesh to that skeleton. Let's put some more to that. Grace is God's unmerited and merciful kindness toward us, expressed chiefly in our salvation as He sovereignly and savingly places us into Christ. Whoever is in Christ is a new creation, but God sovereignly and savingly places us into Christ, and then there, as we are in Christ, He pours out upon us every spiritual blessing. That's Ephesians 1. He pours out upon us all the sanctifying and sustaining gifts of grace that we need to know Him and grow up into Him and be joyful in Him and glorify Him. Grow in grace. But now here's the question. What does it mean to grow in grace? Well, what does that look like? I mean, we've, we've got God's unmerited favor, all the unmerited gifts of grace God pours out upon us in Christ. But what does it mean to grow in grace? Well, we grow in this way. I think here's the emphasis. We grow in our daily reliance upon God's grace. This is what it looks like to grow in grace. Grow in your daily and even moment-by-moment reliance upon God's grace. And in our context, this is a necessary safeguard against being carried away by the error of unprincipled men. Because remember, the error of unprincipled men was not just doctrinal, was it? It was moral. At the root of it was pride. It is, hey, I'm my own authority here. And I'll distort and deny God's word so I can go do what I want to do. That's the height of arrogance and pridefulness toward God. Well, what's the safeguard so we're not carried down that prideful path? Grow in grace. A total and growing reliance upon God's grace. Growing in our daily reliance upon all that God has provided for life and for godliness. And in effect, this will keep our knee humbly and joyfully bowed before Him. And it's a safeguard against being carried away down these prideful paths. I read in a devotional this week, just paraphrasing here, but you will either wake up today thinking that you can do it all on your own, or trusting in all that God of His grace has done for you. So here's the question. What are you going to rely on today? What are you going to depend on today? All of God's grace-filled gifts toward us. This is what we're going to rely on today and grow in our reliance upon. All of His grace, all of His grace-filled gifts. And so today we're going to rely on His power and not our own strength. We're going to rely on His word and His wisdom and not lean on our own understanding. We're going to trust in His providence instead of having to be in control over everything. We're going to look to Christ instead of continually looking to ourselves. And so grow in grace is growing in our reliance upon all of God's grace-filled gifts toward us in Christ. And there, we are safeguarded against prideful rebellion. And there, we we remain 
steadfast. Grow in grace. Grow in your reliance upon God's grace. Now, the second part of grow, grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Grow in grace, total reliance upon grace, and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And there are two related aspects here. First of all, grow in your knowledge about him. Grow in your understanding of who Jesus is. Grow in your biblical understanding of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But this is not just so that we can have some biblical facts filed away about Jesus in our minds. No. This is so that we can grow in our knowing him. So that we can grow in our relationship to him. That's the idea of growing in our knowledge. In our knowledge about him so that we can grow in our knowing him, in our relationship to him. Believer, I don't, I don't know how often you think about this, but you have a personal relationship with your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And, and notice here how Peter puts it. He says, our Lord and Savior. Right? We are his and he is ours. There's a relationship there. Paul says over in Philippians, he says, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Well, you sure get the impression there that Paul's not just concerned with knowing facts about Jesus. It's the surpassing value of knowing him. There's a relationship there. Peter, you might remember, said in his first letter, It's this great definition, I think, of of a faith relationship. But he says there in his first letter, though you have never seen Jesus, though you've never seen Jesus, you love him. And though you do not see him now, you believe in him, and you rejoice with a joy inexpressible and full of glory. That's a personal relationship. We sing that old praise and worship song. It's kind of an oldie goldie now, but it's one of my favorites. But there's a line in it that says, My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. Right? We're not just singing that out into outer space somewhere. We're singing that to a person. A person with whom we are in relationship. A person with whom... We, we see now by faith, by faith, but one day we will see face to face. We are in personal relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, Peter says grow in that relationship, both in your knowledge about him, but so that we can grow in our knowing him. And of course, one of the primary ways we do that, we just keep coming back to it. It's to the Word. It's to the Bible as he communicates himself and reveals himself to us in the word, and then we are moved through the Holy Spirit to respond to him in prayer and adoration and worship, and there's this growing relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And this, too, is a safeguard, isn't it? You're not going to want to be carried down any path that causes you to take your eyes off of the one you love and the one you treasure your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, Peter ends this letter. It's very interesting. There's no list of names and, you know, so-and-so greets you and this person sends their greetings and greet one another, you know, like we often see at the end of many New Testament letters. Peter simply ends with this, to him. Who's the him here? Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him belongs glory. That's praise, exaltation, adoration, worship. To him belongs glory, both now and into eternity's day. Peter puts the unending glory of Jesus front and center as he ends this letter. He puts the unending glory of Jesus front and center and in our view and in our sights as he ends this letter. And, you know, there are teaching points here we could emphasize about 
Christology and the deity of Jesus as it's seen here. But you know what stuck in my mind all week is, is the personal life of Peter. Particularly as we know from chapter 1, Peter's told us that his death is imminent. He's getting ready to depart this earthly tabernacle. Likely he's in a jail cell awaiting execution under Nero, arrested being a follower of Jesus and awaiting execution. Uh, The church historian Eusebius tells us that on the same day that Peter was executed, his wife was executed. Peter's wife was executed. So maybe she's in a jail cell too. What is Peter's focus as the end of his life draws near? Is it, well... Is it, is it bitterness? Like, well, look where my, my life's ended up. In a jail cell. And my wife, too. Boy, what a raw deal we ended up getting here. No. He's shepherding these believers right to the end of his life, fulfilling the mission that Christ gave to him to shepherd the sheep. He's shepherding the believers right to the end. And right to the end of his life, he's singing praise to Jesus declaring forth to Jesus be glory both now and into eternity's day. Front and center in Peter's vision is the glory of Christ as he goes to meet the Lord Jesus Christ. And by way of application, beloved ones, and we'll close here, how I want this to be true of my own life as well. You and I don't have any control over how our life will end. We don't have any control over what kind of death God will choose, God will ordain for us to bring glory to Him. We don't have any control over that. But how often do we find ourselves saying, boy, I don't want my life to end up like this. You know, I don't want my life to end up in a nursing home. I don't want to end up in a hospital bed. I don't want to end up alone. I don't want to end up like this or dependent on somebody. I don't want to end up like that. Well, here's the question. How do you want to end up? Because we don't have any control over how God will ordain for our life to come to an end. But how do you want to end up? I want to live my life and reach the end of my life, whatever that looks like, declaring just what Peter declares here. To my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, be glory, both now and and into eternity's day where I get to see Him face to face, where I get to stand in the light of His glory, where I get to know Him fully even as I am fully known. And may this be our proclamation, beloved ones, both now and as we face eternity, all glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. May our lives end up like this. And all praise to Him. Well, let's close with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we are challenged today by your word. Uh, Help us to grow in grace, to be reliant every day on the grace that you have provided for us. Help us to grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. And Father, we know it's you who causes the growth, and so we pray for that. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen.